fantastic to start us off that way. Um, Chris already introduced me as a hockey mom, but more importantly, I'm a hockey daughter. I was telling Andrew before that my dad was inducted into the 80 plus Hockey Hall of Fame this year. And if you don't know, if you live in Canada and you're still playing hockey when you're 80, you automatically get inducted into the 80 plus Hall of Fame. Um, so, so a long life of, of going to hockey games and following hockey games. And so I know what I'm getting my dad for Christmas this year. Hopefully you'll sign a copy oh, for me. Sure. <laughs> so I think we'll start, uh, each of our panelists uh, will have a few remarks, and I might have a question or, or two for them, but we'll certainly open up. We have a nice intimate group here in a nice room on a wonderful afternoon, so we can have a bit of a discussion. I'm sure lots of you have questions for them. So Ambassador, I'll start with you and, and give us some of your impressions and what led you to, to write this book. All right, well, I'll take uh, 10 minutes or so just to gallop through some uh, thoughts just to lay them out on the table. But uh, you can see this is the stuff of legends. Uh, this was the greatest event in Canadian sports history. And it was the team of the 20th century and the greatest goal ever scored in Canadian history. But it was more than that. The Dominion Institute of Canada said that this was one of the 10 greatest historic moments of the 20th century in Canada. Up there with women's suffrage, Medicare, patriation of the Constitution and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the new Maple Leaf flag, Vimy Ridge, and D-Day. And for 27 days in September 1972, Canadians were mesmerized. The country virtually ground to a halt particularly on September the 28th, for the final and deciding game with the series tied, three wins, three losses, and one tie. So there, I've told you that part of it. <laughs> okay. Businesses really did stop. School children across the country were assembled in gyms and various uh, halls, and they all watched this series on small televisions. It was a common social and cultural element right across the country, coast to coast to coast. Three quarters of the Canadian population watched on television or listened on the radio. 40 to 50 books have been written on this series. Seven alone this year, the 50th anniversary. And as you mentioned, mine is one of those. There have been film and TV series, two this year, including Icebreaker, you've seen a bit of it, commemorative coins and stamps. The House of Commons, three weeks ago, received Team Canada members. On the floor of the House, not in the gallery, there was a five-minute standing ovation for the team. The Prime Minister and the four opposition leaders spent an hour talking about what this series meant for them and for the country. So think about it in terms of the fusion of the politics. Why? Why is this such a big deal? It's an intersection of sports, politics, and diplomacy. And as we know, hockey is good politics and good business. And it's important to be associated with sports heroes. Hockey for Canadians is in our DNA as a northern country. We invented the game, we see it as our birthright. We felt that we were the best in the world. And Canadians can't always say that about too many things. But hockey, we felt we were the best in the world. Back all the way to the 1922 Olympics, the first Winter Olympics, we won gold. We won gold at world championships. And then all of a sudden, this team from the Soviet Union appeared. After the Second World War, they started to move away from a game called bandy on a ball with a really frozen soccer field and took up what was called Canadian ice hockey. And it wasn't very long before they won the world championships in 1954 and then the Olympic gold in 1956. Canada's last Olympic gold, by the way, was in 1952 with the Edmonton Mercuries, and our last world championship was in 1961 with the Trail Smoke Eaters. In the mid-60s, we tried to, another formula, not just using older players from the senior leagues, 
but we created a national team of former professionals and college students, but we still couldn't beat the Soviets. There was great anxiety across the land. This was one thing we held on that we were the best at, but the Soviets kept beating us. So Pierre Elliott Trudeau, in the election of 1968, said that sports is part of culture. Culture is an essential ingredient in national identity and in national unity. He was fighting off the issue of Quebec separatism at the time. But he created Hockey Canada to get us back to our winning ways. But we had no luck with the International Ice Hockey Federation or the International Olympic Committee. The whole issue, who is an amateur and who is a professional, that's something that folks in the United States know it was part of the problem with basketball and the famous uh, Munich Olympics where the Soviet amateurs beat the uh, US amateurs 51 to 50. You couldn't put your best players on the ice and neither on the uh, basketball court and neither could we. So we withdrew from international competition in 1970. The politics and the diplomacy Pierre Trudeau was concerned about the Cold War and Canada's place in the world. He wanted to bring China in from the cold, as the film mentions. He wanted to reduce tensions with the Soviet Union. He wanted to expand relations with the Commonwealth and the Francophonie. And therefore, he wanted to give Canada more breathing room from the United States. Think about that for a few minutes. So we established diplomatic relations with Beijing in October 1970, leading the way there. He wanted to go to the Soviet Union at the same time, but we had an FLQ crisis of terrorism. And he finally goes in May 1971, the first ever visit by a Canadian prime minister. And he doesn't go for one day or two days or three days or seven days. He goes for 12 days all around the Soviet Union. And he signed a controversial protocol on consultations with the Soviets that created great unease here in Washington with the Nixon administration. This was also the time of Nixon and Kissinger playing the China card against Moscow. Ping pong diplomacy comes into play here. But the Soviets in return played what's called the Canadian card. Given Trudeau's friendly uh, attitude, and the availability of American technology in Canada. You can't get American technology from America, you can get it from Canada with plant, branch plant uh, the economy. Kosygin comes back to Canada five months later. He's booed across the country. He's attacked on Parliament Hill. A Hungarian Canadian jumped on his back and rode him like a horse, according to one journalist. He only gets a positive reaction when he goes to Vancouver and watches an NHL hockey game. And the first time ever, the Soviet flag flew in an NHL arena. He got a warm reception, and the light went off for him. The way to improve relations with Canada was through hockey. And we signed a general exchanges agreement, um, included sportsmen, and it created the conditions for a diplomatic overture to bring about this series. Now, the diplomatic goal in all this was to get at the human side of the relationship with the Soviets, much as the West had done during the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe in the mid-70s, with basket three, if you recall that, on human rights and human contacts. We wanted to find common ground Science, education, the fine arts, music, and so on, were all okay as exchanges between East and West. But we wanted something broader and deeper, something that really impacted Soviet citizens and Canadian citizens, and that was hockey. They loved the game as much as we did. Another objective was to break down stereotypes of capitalists rich, exploitive leaders out to destroy the Soviet Union. And you know, today I hear uh, the Russians talking about what's called the golden billion. 
you know, Putin's trying to rally uh, his population behind him. The golden billion is the really Western population out to destroy Russia and seize its assets. So this theme of in the Soviet times and in Russian times is the same, the image of capitalists and of the West. And for us, we wanted to put a human face on communism. And Vladislav Trechak, who you saw there, very urbane, uh, got a good sense of humor. At the time, he was 20 years old. And he was considered a good guy. And TV commentators at the time said, Canadians think you're wonderful. Just think about that, a communist who we thought was wonderful. There were 150 million Soviets who watched this series. You know, while we in Canada ground to a halt with 16, 17 million, 150 million Soviet citizens were watching this series. So it had a great impact. And you know, it's harder to kill your enemy when you have a human face on them. When you know who they are, you recognize them, that you've met them. I often wondered how it was the German soldiers moving east were able to, you know, with their own conscience, kill people uh, in front of them. And I think that it, that's why it's important in east-west relations and in diplomacy to establish these contacts so that the enemy is not just a faceless en enemy that you're going to push a button or drop uh, ordnance from the air on. After this summit series, Russian kids were playing hockey on frozen parking lots using the names of Canadian players. So taking from Canada to the Soviet side. Now what's the legacy? 40, we had a 40 and a 50th anniversary in Moscow of both teams. Putin learned to skate at age 60 and to play hockey. He scored numerous goals. It was said that the other players parted like the Red Sea to allow him to <laughs> score 10 to 12 goals a game. The Soviet, uh, or the Russian anthem for hockey is cowards don't play hockey. And you know, Putin likes to think of himself as a tough guy. So this fits him perfectly. He takes his shirt off and rides a horse through ri cold rivers. He also plays hockey and he surrounded himself with all these players from both the Soviet team and the Canadian team. Association was something that is still very much in the memory of Russian players uh, and the Russian population. Now, the Soviets didn't like the fact that they lost this series, but they turned it around and said the winner was the game of hockey itself. It changed the nature of hockey. We had the best of both worlds. Hockey became internationalized in the United States and Canada, and I mentioned earlier today that uh, roughly 98% of the NHL players in 1972 were Canadians. Now we're down to about 43, 44%. Americans have gone up, but the big jump has been international players, Finns and Swedes and Germans and Slovaks and Russians. So the game has changed. Now what about sports diplomacy? It worked in 1972 to improve relations with the Soviet Union. They went along for a while until Afghanistan uh, in 1979, but for those of you who study foreign policy, there's a thing called the idiosyncratic variable, is the personal connections between people, and Trudeau's affinity to Gorbachev and uh, others in the Soviet Union, I think led to a lot of reforms that went on there. We have Olympic symbolism of pride and prestige, People will, uh, countries will spend whatever money it takes to win medals. That also leads us into the issue of doping. Uh, I guess the prime example of a doping country is the GDR, German Democratic Republic. In the 1972 Munich Games, they finished third after the Soviet Union and US. They had uh, a third more medals than West Germany, even though they had only one third the population. Hockey, uh, or the Olympics rather, the cost of hockey and the cost of the Olympics is massive now. Billions of dollars are involved. 
There's a thing called, today we won't really talk about it unless you have questions, but sports washing. How a country tries to change its image through sport. And the best example of that is in the golfing world, where you've got the Saudis creating a new league, even though they don't play golf themselves. But they be, they've lured all the best players from uh, Europe and the United States to play for them in order to improve their image. But hockey and sports are also a unifier. They cross nations. They have something in common with people up and down the social scale. And hockey for us has been a bridge. It was a bridge to the Soviet Union, started in 1972, and it continues today. Um, a month ago, the Russian Minister of Sport issued a statement on the uh, 50th anniversary, and he talked about the hockey bridge still being there. So it's very important that uh, we keep lines of communications open. Even though we've got this vile situation in Ukraine, we need to have ears, eyes, and a voice uh, in Moscow. And we also have to use every form we can, transmission belts, lines of communication, to make sure that this situation doesn't spiral out of control. And one final thing I'd say before turning it back to you would be, you know, hockey, we talk about what a great sport it is, but in recent days in Canada, if you've been following it, we've had uh, a big scandal, a sex scandal involving hockey players. And I think people have come around to realize that this is not a game just for men, young boys, where they can do whatever they want to, that there's women are involved now, people from all ethnic backgrounds. There has to be openness and accountability and we have to make it a safe sport for everyone to enjoy as much as we did back in 1972. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And, and you, you know, your remarks and also your book kind of describes you really the, the onion where, you know, for someone like me growing up just thought, oh, there was a hockey game and we won. And that's great. But you show everything that went into it and all the meaning it had, you know, in so many different ways. Um, so congratulations on that. And I'm going to turn it over to Andrew to offer his reflections on the book and also as a hockey historian, a sports historian, kind of what some thoughts on what it all means, Andrew. I loved it. Green, 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 green. I'll say a little bit more than that. Um, I, I do want to start off by saying how much I in, enjoyed Ice War Diplomat. And uh, this comes from somebody who has read a lot about uh, the Summit series, some of it um, self-congratulatory, some of it um, bad history, some of it very good history. Uh, this book, almost every page, I would say, has some new insight on the series itself, but also its broader meaning. And so um, if all of this doesn't recommend it to you, then, um, well, take it from me as well. I think you really should read it. But I do want to talk, and maybe my comments will overlap a little bit with what Ambassador Smith has to say about the book and the context, and as somebody who is a hockey historian, um, what the meaning of all of it is for Canada and for uh, Canadian diplomacy. And so I'll come back to something that was part of Ambassador, Ambassador Smith's uh, comments. And if we ask the question, well, what is it that makes hockey Canadian? It's at the core, really, of all of this discussion, of the stories that we tell about hockey and about this particular story. And you touched on some of these items. Uh, the first one, of course, is that Canadians invented it. It was a group of McGill and ex-McGill students in 1875 who came together on the Victoria Rink in Montreal and combined elements of lacrosse and equipment from rugby and ideas from uh, bandy. Uh, created a new thing called a hockey puck uh, and uh, formed rules for a new game, rules that were printed in the Montreal Gazette that ultimately became chipped away at and changed over time by the bedrock, right? If you codify the rules, then you create this new game. Uh, and also uh, on the 3rd of March, 1875, when it happened, it ended appropriately with a fight. <laughs> Maybe not so appropriately these days, but it certainly was part of the tradition. So Canadians invented it. And of course, uh, for the longest time, Canadians have been the best at it. Uh, they certainly were right up until the early 1950s in international hockey and uh, 
Uh, some would make the argument that they continue to be so, if not the very best, then among the very best in the world. And so that's part of answering the question, what makes hockey Canadian? Um, but, and we saw it in the opening frames here uh, as well of this, uh, what looks to be beautiful film, uh, that hockey is acted as kind of a metaphor for Canadian life. And I know that sounds a little bit trumped up and you can always poke holes in big, broad, sweeping statements like that. But the idea that somehow hockey is a corollary of the northern myth of Canada, um, that Canadians are northern and it makes them distinctive and, and hockey is a way in which they've somehow uh, whipped winter or at least tamed it in some way and made it useful. But I'd say the fourth thing, and this really does um, push on, on more directly on the subject of the book, is that hockey's become a kind of calling card uh, for Canada in the world. It's one of the things uh, that other countries identify Canada with, um, and Canadians have trumped that up as well, right? It's become part of their soft power, uh, part of their diplomacy, part of the way since the at least early 1900s when uh, as good evangelicals they spread the gospel of hockey around the world to places like England and France and Scandinavia and Bohemia and uh, uh, Italy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so it's remained that central part and then for it to play such an important role in a book like this I think is worth the emphasis that, that hockey can be and continues to be uh, part of Canada's soft power a diplomacy as useful perhaps as cultural or academics or music or whatever. Um, I quote uh, my, my friend John Soares who teaches at Notre Dame about this idea of diplomacy and hockey existing together. Uh, hockey brings home the message perhaps better than any other form of culture. One can debate, he says, the merits of a piece by Copeland or Shostakovich, but there's no debate over who won a hockey game. And so in keeping with that whole idea and having established the notion that hockey is Canadian in these ways, um, it does really call into, well, maybe shine some light on the way in which Canada won this series. As you'll see, and I hope you continue on, the cat's out of the bag now <laughs> about who won, but in a glorious uh, um, final goal in game eight with 34 seconds left on the clock, Paul Henderson, um, Canada's greatest goal scored on a rebound, right, rather than a beautiful slap shot or whatever, uh, wins it for Canada. But in the process of doing that, and over the course of eight games, um, the way they won it was distinctive. It was uh, through grit and determination, through skill for sure, uh, and largely through physical violence as well. And this becomes uh, a major point of complaint among uh, Russian diplomats, as Ambassador Smith tells us, but it's not lost on, um, on others who are watching as well. It said uh, Boston announcer Johnny Pearson, who used to play for the Bruins way back in the day, they had a local, um, Channel 38 had a feed in Boston, and they had local uh, Bruins announcers who were doing the play-by-play. And Johnny Pearson, who had served in the Air Force for Canada in the, the Second World War, said at the end of game one, we saw how it ended, right? I always thought that hockey was war, but I never thought it would be Dunkirk. Um, I think the reference was probably lost on uh, local New Englanders, but uh, uh, nonetheless there he said it. But this is important, right? If we think about hockey as being used as a calling card for Canada around the world, isn't it important the way that you win? And the way that Canada won here um, left for many a bad taste in people's mouths. Stephen Smith said, uh, Canadian hockey in 1972 caught a bad cold that it didn't recover from for a decade and a half. So incidents like Bobby Clark's slash on... Uh, star player Valery Harlamov's ankle breaking it, even though he skated on in uh, games afterwards, fisticuffs that took place, um, violence that ended up with uh, Boris Mihailov uh, kicking Gary Bergman in the shins with his skates, which is a no-no, you never do that uh, in hockey. All of this, I think, is important for us to remember, To What happens as a result? Yes, what happens is the grand convergence, the coming together, 
of East and West in terms of styles, in terms of player exchanges and co coaches exchanges, and ultimately the modern hockey world in which hockey that's being played in Eastern Europe is very much similar to hockey being played in North America. But what also happened in the immediate aftermath was this, this resort to violence, the rise of the Broad Street bullies, the rise of the big bad Bruins, uh, and at least for 15, maybe 20 years, um, the rise of a culture in hockey about which we maybe shouldn't be too proud or boastful. Happily, hockey survived that, and ha happily, hockey as a part of Canada's diplomatic calling card survives that as well. Let me just um, finish off by uh, talking about what this book does that other books don't do. And Ambassador Smith is being uh, quite humble. He uh, has been all afternoon, and he certainly is in this account in talking about his role in this. But it's the actual nitty-gritty uh, bits of negotiation, of keeping the discussions on the rails, uh, as he mentions, um, that was critical to 1972 happening at all. There were so many times, it seems from this account, in which this series could have fallen off the rails. And if that happens, then what? Scotty Greenwood asked us this afternoon. If that happens, then what? Does this convergence in the hockey world uh, ever happen? Maybe not, maybe not till later, uh, but it's through the kind of careful, uh, judicious uh, diplomacy that Ambassador Smith himself uh, did that I th think uh, should be celebrated more than it has been in the past. I'm hopeful that this book and this film are going to do that. Wow, thank you so much. You described hockey so beautifully, almost like a poet, really. And I'm a political scientist, and I think we need more humanities on some of our panels because you're far more eloquent than most social scientists that I sit on panels with. So thank you for that. And you brought up many wonderful points. And, um, you know, my, myself reading the book, uh, of course, it reminds you of today. You know, is, is there had been a Cuban Missile Crisis. They hadn't. There were sanctions because they invaded. You know, Czechoslovakia, and we're. You know, we're not in a dissimilar situation in, in some ways. You know, history repeating itself, but of course, everything is is different. And so, Blair, that turns to you. Is you know, the title of the book is Ice War Diplomat. Um, and what, you know, what is that intersection and, and how did this event, you mentioned that it was up there with Vimy Ridge, with suffrage, with repatriating the Constitution. Um, how, does, how, does a, how does a sporting event you know, get to achieve kind of those heights? So maybe, I'll, maybe this is a good time to turn over to you, Blair. Well, that's a pretty big order for me to try to <laughs> fill out in five minutes. And I, I, I don't think I'm going to totally answer that, but I, I, I do want to come back at the very end to a point that Ambassador Smith made about Canada's role in Glasnost. So I'll, and I'll end up there, which opens the door to that bigger discussion. But let me start with a personal story. Uh, Paul Henderson's series winning goal with 34 seconds left is my most vivid sports memory, bar none. Uh, I still remember just a, minute, a few minutes before, I had walked out of Professor Skilling's uh, seminar on comparative communist political systems into a common room at the University of Toronto. And the room was chock-a-block full with students and professors and others surrounded by TV sets, just as you described was taking place across the country. And just as I kind of settled in to see what was happening, Henderson scored his goal. And the world went nuts. Now, by way of background, I had uh, come to the University of Toronto uh, the year before. So this was the beginning of my second year of, of graduate studies in political science at the University of Toronto. And I had been drawn to the University of Toronto because of a particularly strong but somewhat idiosyncratic collection of faculty who specialized on Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. And it, it was a wonderful decision because they did something that wasn't being done in other places in North America. They didn't treat Soviet politics as studying the adversary. They would acknowledge that obviously there was a Cold War. But rather they wanted us to understand that Soviet politics was just one of many different kinds of comparative studies you could undertake in political science. 
And that's a very subtle difference, but it's an important one, and it's one that I carry through my career. Now, having grown up in suburban uh, New York and having just graduated from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Toronto and Canada and graduate school all required something of an adjustment. My years at Carolina coincided with uh, tremendous campus protest and unrest over lingering Jim Crow segregation, something we forget about and we shouldn't, uh, and, and also the exploding war in Vietnam. And when I arrived at Toronto, it wasn't still the Toronto the good of lore, but it did seem to me after these other experiences to be surprisingly passionless. And um, having grown up as something of a Rangers fan, I enjoyed being in a city where hockey was more important than basketball. There's no doubt about that. And I learned to appreciate urban life in a clean, efficient, dynamic Toronto, lorded over, if for those who remember, Ontario, by Ontario Premier Bill Davis's big blue Tory machine. Uh, it was my first experience with cities that worked. That was all important, but there was also a strikingly passive-aggressive anti-Americanism that kind of confused me a bit because clearly uh, there was um, dislike and distrust of the neighbor to the south, but again, it all seemed strangely without emotion. And I couldn't understand what was this world uh, or as a, a Soviet friend of mine later said, is Toronto really that boring? <laughs> and, and, but Toronto had a way, it was like there was this blanket over emotions. Mm -hmm. And then Henderson scored the goal. And it was like my Toronto went from black and white to color. Uh, groups of Torontonians ran out into the streets. They were shouting, they were dancing, they were chanting, they were singing, oh Canada and they were waving that new maple leaf flag, which they had still been calling derisively Pearson's pennant. Mm -hmm. Torontonians, it turned out, actually cared about their country. They cared about having pride in their country, and of course, they cared about their birthright, which was hockey. So this moment wasn't just a sports moment for me personally, it was a moment of discovery. And while I didn't attend the raucous homecoming celebrations a few days later at Toronto City Hall Plaza, and for those of you who, who know about it, it was really quite an event. Uh, unfortunately, I think Professor Skilling had us back in his seminar room. I heard all about it from my Canadian friends. But the story doesn't end there for me. For the next four decades, I would repeatedly go back to the Soviet Union and to Russia. And this picks up on some of the themes that Ambassador Smith said as well. Over and over again, I met colleagues for whom the 1972 Summit Series was a life-altering event. Now, some of this was obviously the drama of the game, but some of it gets to something Andrew was talking about. Following their team's victories in Canada, they remained unprepared for the Canadian onslaught in Moscow, which, as you point out, was an onslaught. Um, and the defeat was a crushing blow for many, which they carried forward in their lives. And some even said to me, you know, this was the first time we understood you should never trust the West because they don't play by everybody else's rules. It was a discovery which transcended Soviet propaganda. It was personal and it was deep. And those people carry it forward to this day, which I think gives a little insight onto some of what's gone wrong. There was a sense of being humiliated by the West, which has stayed. Now, there's one coda to my personal hockey um, odyssey here. About a decade ago, when I was director of the Kennan Institute, we organized a series of very high-profile seminars on Russian influences on American culture, including sports. And we did ballet and film and theater. Um, it, it, it was really a remarkable uh, group of people, music, 
Uh, and for sports, Ken Dryden spoke. I mean, what a thrill, right, to be sitting there chairing. I, I once chaired a meeting for Gorbachev and Ken Dryden. Those are my heights as, as chairs. Um, but Ken Dryden, Dryden said something which is really quite remarkable. It shows what a thoughtful person he is. He used his remarks to talk about the advantages of backwardness, which of course is a big theme for anybody who studied Soviet and Russian economics. But he did so in a way that was far more eloquent than I ever heard an economist talk about this. He said, if you play outdoors on poorly maintained ice, you learn how to skate really, really well. If your poorly produced hockey sticks explode at a slap shot, you learn how to pass and how to finesse goals. And if your teams have too few skilled players, you protect them by discouraging fighting. And what became clear uh, listening to Dryden is that the arrogant, overly pampered Team Canada was, in fact, set up for a fall, the fall of arrogance. And the miracle was, in the end, that the team recovered and actually managed to eke out a victory in the series. And that was a true set, uh, lesson in resilience because they easily could have folded and, and gone home. And finally, I just want to touch on one point that Ambassador Smith said in passing, but here in Washington it gets scant attention. And that's the role of Canada and Trudeau in promoting Glasnost. Alexander Yakovlev was um, Gorbachev's guru when it came to Glasnost. And where was he just before Gorbachev came to power? He had been banished from the Politburo and sent off to be ambassador in Ottawa. And Trudeau cultivated him and spent a lot of time having him come over, get to know the family. And as they were doing all of that, showing him how Canadian democracy worked, how Canadian agriculture worked. And when Gorbachev made his first really big international trip abroad, he was still, uh, he wasn't yet general secretary, but he was in the secretariat. And it was a sort of coming out party. Where did he go? He went to Canada. And Yakovlev took him under his wing and showed him the Canada that Trudeau had shown Yakovlev. This is a little quiet part of the story that often gets overlooked. But I once had an opportunity. It was in a quiet moment. I was um, speaking at an event in Moscow where Gorbachev was. And you know, you're trying to make small talk as you're waiting to go on. And I, I said, do you remember anything about your trip to Canada? And he said, yes, it was really important to me. So I think, again, we can talk, we can sort of say, well, this is just a game. But it's a game that began to really change how the world functioned. And maybe right now, Maybe Putin can be ambassador to Canada sometime. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. And again, beautifully spoken. Um, so just wonderful, you know, introduction and, and knowledge and expertise and the breadth that you all have. And reminds me of a different time of Canadian foreign policy with a different Trudeau, really, where Canada was trying to distinguish itself from the Americans and now just trying to kind of... Uh, I don't want to be too critical, but <laughs> hiding under the coattails a little bit. Very different time. It's interesting to reflect on that. But we don't have too much time left, but I do want to open it up to a handful of questions because this is such a wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Go ahead. How actually important this, this was, not just for Canada, but eight years later, this was very important for the U.S. and their defeat of the Soviets at a time of Afghanistan and so forth. 
but it was a guy watching in Minnesota in 1972 named Herb Brooks that watched the Soviets and then beat them at their own game and created the modern game that we see now. If you could just comment on the threads. Do I detect a Minnesota accent there? No, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. Okay. <laughs> it's a great question. Um, what are the links between 72 and 80? And of course, the same themes kind of play out again, right? In, in 1980, the, the big bad uh, Russian machine and, uh, and these young, fresh-faced uh, college, of course, they weren't college kids. They recently graduated from college and some of them were playing minor pro and they were, they were paid a monthly stipend and all that sort of thing. So that myth has been built up by movies like Miracle and and others, but in, in there, there are some very big parallels between what that moment in Lake Placid does uh, for uh, weaving together national identity and politics, uh, and feeling good at a bad time, uh, and the the 1972 series. Uh, I can see some similarities as well, um, but there's some differences too. Um, the United States players weren't weighed down by the same kind of weight of history, weight of expectation, uh, weight of hubris that Canadian players were. And um, I've heard it on many, many, many occasions from players who were in that situation. You couldn't believe the pressure. I think you mentioned that in your book as well. You can't believe the pressure. Um, Mike Ruzioni didn't have that pressure. Jim Craig didn't have that pressure, although they certainly had pressure of a certain sort playing at home in such a high-stake um, event. But the contrast was that the Soviets had that pressure, pressure in 80, that the Canadians probably felt in 72. I remember seeing an interview yeah. with Trek Jack when he said it was, even, it was worse even going back in 1980 after losing to the Americans than losing to the pro-Canadians in 72. We all felt we were going to be shot. Yeah. So, I mean, if that's the interesting juxtaposition that you rise, is where, where the different pressures lie with the respective teams. That's, that's an excellent point. I think so. Uh, I think also there's, um, there's a kind of a fatigue that sets in amongst the Russian national team by the end of the 1970s. The expectations are that they're you know, ho-hum, another championship too. I, I know this just from per personal anecdote. I happened to luck out and play in a Friday night hockey uh, beer league with both Jim Craig and Vladimir Luchenko, who played in the 72 series as well as the 1980 series. And um, I remember talking with uh, Luchenko. He had passable English. He was a scout for the Rangers, I think, at the time. And uh, his... His response was that he was tired of everybody asking him about 1980. So when I asked him about 1972, he brought in all his memorabilia and showed me. And um, for him, that that was the key moment, the key pivot of change. And while 1980 has very great importance and symbolism to to us here in the United States, perhaps less so for them. That's what he said. Just one last thing. With, with, I don't know if you have a comment to this, but. If you look at the Soviet players at the end of the 1980 game, you could see they're just looking at these young kids going crazy with amazement. And you can kind of, Trixie had talked about this in a separate interview, where he talked about, we realized at that time that this was supposed to be fun, like you mentioned, and we weren't having fun. We were just supposed to grind out wins. We were an instrument of propaganda at this point and nothing more. Yeah, true. I was just going to say that um, where does pressure lie? If you're an underdog, there's no pressure. So there was no pressure on the Americans, even though it was a uh, game played in the United States. The big difference here is that this, the, this 1972 series was an eight-game series, not a one-game uh, match, and it was played in two very different uh, locations, in Canada and the Soviet Union. And as mentioned in the film, uh, the Soviets didn't expect to win. They th their objective was to keep it close. Don't be humiliated because the uh, head of the uh, of ideology in the Communist Party, Mikhail Suslov, was against this series because he thought it would destroy the myth of 
1,000 goals to one. So they were the underdogs. Team Canada was expected to be the By the time game four was over in Vancouver, the Canadians were being booed off the ice, right? Everybody had given up on them in a sense. Whereas the Russians went back to Moscow and they broke their regime, the great training regime that they had. They started to go to parties hosted by cosmonauts and others. They started to not show up for practice. And then they became the, uh, the pressure came on them. There's Brezhnev right there at the rink. There's Kosygin right there. They only had to win one more game and they couldn't do it. So the pressure came back on them. And you mentioned Trejcik uh, when I was in Moscow a year ago talking with him. He, he said in the bad old days of uh, Stalin and Beria, if you embarrassed the Soviet Union, then it was curtains. And he said, we knew that we wouldn't be shot if we lost. But he said, uh, I guess it's not politically correct to say this, but he said that uh, our next Olympics, if we lost, would be the Special Olympics because they would suffer a crippling, crippling response. So there is tremendous pressure. There's pressure of prestige, but in the Soviet Union, not only does, uh, you know, you lose the, uh, you know, the, the, protocol and, and the prestige of it, but you lose your apartment, you lose your car, you lose your special access to stores and meat and so on. All those things go with being part of the Soviet elite and part of the party. So it's a whole package and that creates enormous pressure on you. So you're saying the Soviet Premier got a better uh, welcome in, in Vancouver at the rink than the Canadian team did. Chris, I see you have the microphone. or. There's one other question, unless you had a question or you were going to finish it off. Well, I, you know, this has been a wonderful session. It's a deep clean at the moment of that you can see your film here, isolated, fantastic. The discussion, terrific. And now we're going to recreate a very special moment with Blair Rubel's live. We're going to be adjourned where we can keep talking, ask questions. In the next room, you will find a reception with Canadian beer. Uh, this on and find. We also have, we're very, uh, our friends at Paul, copies of the book available, and of course you have the author here to sign it, if, you, uh, if he is so kind, and, uh, and I just want to thank all of our panelists, all of our audience for being part of this very special discussion, and, uh, and most of all thanks to you, Ambassador Smith, you've done a fine job of adding an element of history that I think was too little known, and we owe you a great debt of thanks. <laughs>